Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on options for retaining current employees and future recruitment. Today, ECA's Employment and Skills team will outline the options businesses have to help them retain employees in these challenging times, above and beyond the furlough scheme. They will offer guidance on reducing hours, reducing pay, unpaid leave, and other measures, as well as ECA's own loan labour scheme. The team will also assess the various support measures for job protection, job creation, and young people announced by government in recent weeks, and advise <coughs> on how ECA members might make use of these. On our panel today, we have Snare Doshi, Senior Employee Relations Advisor, who will talk about alternatives to furlough and redundancy. Then we have Andrew Eldred, our Director of Employment and Skills, who will cover temporary loan and secondment arrangements. And finally, our Head of Education and Training, Carolyn Mason, will cover new apprentices and the Kickstart scheme. Now, today's webinar will include a Q&A. You will find a questions panel on your screen. Do please make use of this throughout today's presentations. I'll be monitoring those and together with our, our panelists at the end of the session, we'll try to get through as many of your questions as we can. And finally, viewers are reminded that a full replay of today's session, as well as replays of the entire ECA webinar series so far, uh, will be available on ECA's YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash ECA live. Uh, and also for more information and ECA guidance on everything related to business recovery, visit www.eca.co.uk forward slash business dash recovery. And I hope you enjoy the session. I'll now hand over to Sneha for her part of the presentation. Thank you, Omar. Can we have the slide number three? Is that slide number three? No. Um, hello and welcome to everyone who is listening to us. So in today's webinar, I'm going to talk about employment and COVID-19. But for once, the focus won't be on furlough. How's that even possible, you ask? Well, stay tuned and find out. Next slide, please, Omar. First, though, for those of you still hungry for information on furlough and redundancy, after listening to this webinar, please go onto the web page on your screens, which I think Omar just said at the beginning of this intro, for our furlough and redundancy guides. You may also find it helpful to listen to the previous employment webinars, which was focused on flexible furlough. But as I said, please don't all rush off now and leave me talking to myself. Wait until the end of the webinar. Next slide, please, Omar. Now that you know what we aren't going to focus on, let's move on to what we will be talking about today. Um, as we head into even more uncertain times with the end of the government's job retention scheme, Brexit, and the ongoing impact of COVID-19, many companies will find that the employment model for their business is no longer sustainable. Many employers anticipated a large number of redundancies at the start of the lockdown until the government's announcement and introduction of the furlough scheme. You may recall that the main reason given by the government for the introduction of the furlough scheme was to avoid redundancies during lockdown. However, with the end of the furlough scheme looming, many of you may instinctively therefore look to redundancies to manage work sorry, manage changes in workload. However, I hope you will agree that redundancy remains the very last and least preferred option. The aim of this webinar, therefore, is to help you to be better prepared to consider other options to both furlough and redundancies. That's the next slide, please, Emma. So there are many reasons that you may look at changes to the way you employ people in the coming months. Firstly, there's likely to be a decline um, in the requirements for workers for many employers due to restrictions on sites for safety reasons and a fall in overall demand due to economic uncertainty. We also have the changes to the furlough scheme and are now at the first of three stages of increasing costs for employers under the scheme and the scheme itself is due to end on 31st of October. And then, of course, let's not forget the employees who were never eligible for furlough either. 
perhaps the government's plan for the furlough bonus will be an incentive for some employers to try and retain employees a little longer. Under the scheme, employers may claim a £1,000 furlough bonus from the government for each employee brought out of furlough and kept continuously employed until the end of January 2021. Last but not least, the downturn in workload may only be temporary, but you may want to keep your employees so that they are available and ready for when work picks up. These may be people whom you have invested in with training and mentoring over the years and who you know to be good employees. Next slide, please, Omar. So the key, as it is with many things in 2020, is flexibility. I don't just mean that employees must be flexible. You as employers are also likely to have had to be flexible enough to meet the ever-changing demands of the law, clients, suppliers and employees over the last few months. I expect some of you as employers have had to be so flexible that you may be looking to start a new career as contortionists and I don't blame you. <laughs> You may find that you are not the only one looking for change and flexibility in the workplace. The last few months have had a huge impact on people's mental well-being, as things like anxiety for their physical health and job security, lack of social interaction have all taken their toll on many employees. However, the experiences of the last few months has also given many people the time and space to consider their life choices. Spending time away from work, not commuting on a daily basis and spending more time with immediate family has led to many people not wishing to return to their pre-March 2020 work routines. This may mean that employees may be more amenable to agreeing changes to their work life than they would have been in the past. Also, tasks which were previously thought to be essential have been found to be non-essential and many other tasks can be completed remotely rather than on company premises. Our guidance on alternatives to furlough and redundancy looks at several options for you as employers to consider. The guidance identifies some of the pros and cons of the options. The factors that you may need to take into consideration when contemplating the introduction of each option and some sample documents. So what are some of the options we've covered in the guidance? Could we have the next slide please Omar? So the first item, the first topic we've covered is training. Employees on furlough can take training, undertake training provided that the training does not provide services to or generate revenue for or on behalf of the employer or a linked or associated organisation. That's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? But you get what I mean. If they tr do any training, you mustn't get any financial benefits straight away. If you didn't take advantage of this provision or were unable to do so up till now, then now may be time to ensure that all your employees have the skills and qualifications that they may need for when there is more work available. Andrew's going to talk about some aspects of training for apprentices in the next part of this webinar. So I'll move on to the next item, which is alternative duties. This could be anything from a short period of changes in the employee's duties to a longer term change in job role and it is something that needs careful handling, as it could be seen as a demotion in some instances. You will also need to be clear about any other changes that the alternative duties may entail, such as reduction in pay, loss of pay, vehicles, etc., so that the employee are able to make an informed decision on whether the alternative duties offered are acceptable to them. Next, we have reduced hours working. As with alternative duties, this can also cover a broad band range of possibilities, and it's important to be clear on what the changes are, how long are they likely to last for, etc. And then the last one on this slide is annual leave. 
This is something that many employers have already done while their employees were on furlough, so that at least some of the annual leave was funded by the government. If your employees have not used up their annual leave entitlement for the year, it is still possible to require employees to take annual leave for both, both those who are on furloughed and those who are not on furloughed if you are facing a temporary downturn in workload. And we can talk to you about how you can do that, how you can enforce annual leave if you contact us. Next slide, please, Omar. So leave on reduced pay or unpaid leave. This is something you may need to consider if there is a shortage drop in work and all, your annual, all the annual leave has already been taken up by the employee. Agreed unpaid leave is also a helpful tool for employees whose work can't be done from home and who refuse to leave home to carry out work due to concerns of, over those in their household who were shielding and are still very vulnerable. Reduced pay. Again, this can be anything from a short period of a few days to weeks or even months. Would it be a certain amount of reduction or a percentage of their normal pay rate? Would it be across the whole business? <clears throat> Will it just apply to certain payments such as shift work or travel or overtime? Then we move on to temporary layoff and short time working. Both of these have a specific definition in law and rules that relate to them. So if you're considering them as options, then it is strongly advisable to speak to the ECA employee relations team. That's me or my colleague, Orazio Amantia. Our contact details are at the end of my set of slides. And then last on this list is loaning, seconding off employees. I'll leave Andrew to talk about loaning and seconding of labour in the next section of this webinar, in particular the assistance ECA can offer and how to access it. Next slide please Omar. As with many aspects of life, it's not a case of one size fits all. Our guidance document highlights factors that should be taken into consideration for each option but you may find other factors that you need to take into consideration. Similarly, whilst the guidance sets out each separate option, you may find that your business needs require a combination of more than one option to be implemented. This is fine, provided that you've reached an agreement with the employees affected. And as time moves on, you may find that different options are suitable for your business as the situation evolves over time or that you need to implement more than one option at a given moment in time. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Omar. In deciding which option or combination of options you may wish to seek to implement and how you may wish to introduce them, the immediacy of the, of the need to resolve an issue is likely to play an important role. Has your biggest client suddenly introduced restrictions on the numbers of people allowed on site? Or are you looking at a problem with material supplies in a few months down the line? How flexible can you be? Is there any wiggle room in your plans and your proposals? Are you able to give assurances on some benefits to employees which will remain unaffected? So for example, giving holidays based on pre-March hours of work for those who agree to a reduction in working hours. What resources are available to you? ECA membership is a resource that should not be undervalued. Come and talk through your plans with us to ensure that you're not about to ask for something that is not allowed under the law. Money of course, is one of the most effective sweeteners when asking employees to agree to changes in their terms and conditions of work, but there may not be a lot of it around to offer at this stage. And then we look at, you know, what are the longer term, what's the longer term outlook? Are you looking for a reduction in work for a few days or weeks, or is this likely to be an ongoing issue into the longer term? Next slide, please, Omar. As with many aspects of employment, 
clear communication is key to success in achieving what you want and need to achieve with the employees affected. That communication needs to be two-way. So be prepared to listen to what the employees have to say. If they suggest other options, at least be prepared to consider them and then give a brief explanation of why the, if the suggestion would not suit your business. Another important feature of achieving your objectives is flexibility. Again, this needs to be from both sides. At least be prepared to consider being flexible and amend the parameters of the changes you're seeking if employees put forward reasonable and feasible alternatives. We're very much into uncharted waters, so it's advisable to build in flexibility on any changes agreed. A good way to do this is to incorporate review periods once the change is agreed and implemented so that you can make further amendments if necessary. You are, of course, more likely to succeed in achieving an agreement to the changes sought if you have a good relationship with your employees based on mutual trust. It's also important to, be, to both be fair and seem to be fair. So, for example, if you're not asking for all employees to agree to changes, then it's again strongly advisable to explain your reasoning for this. Next slide, please, Emma. Now, we couldn't possibly end this part of my talk without mentioning the importance of confirming any changes in writing. It's part of clear communication, which I mentioned earlier, and it's really important in ensuring that both parties are agreed on the same things. People often hear what they want to hear, not what's actually been said. So putting things in writing in a clear and concise way is an important part of the process. We've included sample letters in our alternatives to furlough and redundancy guidance, which can easily be amended to the terms agreed with your employees. So please use them. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. That's before we go on to the next bit. Sorry. I just wanted to say um, for those of you in the JIB, we advise that you contact us at the ECA Employee Relations Department to discuss your options which, when seeking flexibility from any employees within scope of the JIB agreement. Um, sorry, I just wanted to put that caveat in for JIB member companies, for those who are within scope of the JIB. So thank you very much for listening. And now I'll hand over to Andrew to talk about loaning and seconding of employees. Yeah, thanks uh, for that. Uh, Sneha um, and hello everybody. Um, yeah, um, Sneha's, what Sneha has been talking about in general um, has really been confined to, if you like, the boundaries of a, a single organisation, single business um, in um, isolation. What, what I'm going to talk about here involves something a bit broader and it involves collaboration between two or, or, or even more uh, businesses. Um, which really comes from part of being part of a community, being uh, part of, of an association, um, if you like. Um, next slide, Omar. Okay, so what I'm talking about here is the temporary loan, temporary secondment, different words for the same thing, um, of, of, of employees. So it's a, obviously, it's, as I've said, it's a bilateral arrangement between two businesses, between two employers, although important to bear in mind, and following on from some of the comments that Snare's already made, that there are actually other people involved in this as well. Uh, the employees themselves, and I, I absolutely uh, endorse what Snare just said about the importance of communication, uh, the importance of you know maintaining a good relationship with your employees, because they're very much involved um, in, in being part of this and, and making it a success. Uh, of course, the other aspect, and I'll come back to this in more detail later on, is when you're dealing with apprentices, uh, not only do you have the apprentice to consider, but you've also got uh, the college and the training provider and also the training objectives for the apprentice to consider. That said, in principle, there are plenty of good reasons uh, for going down this road um, if it makes sense uh, for your business, taking into account all the different factors uh, that Sine has mentioned already, plus I guess plenty of others that you can think of for yourselves. Um, I mean, obviously from the point of view of the uh, the lender, uh, the person with, with the labour 
um, uh, potentially to be len lent. Um, the, the obvious advantages are avoiding redundancy costs, potentially in the longer term, uh, avoiding future recruitment uh, costs, particularly galling if you end up uh, recruiting again people you previously paid uh, to make redundant. Um, obviously, keeping uh, good people. One of the paradoxes of the furlough scheme, and particularly some of the recent changes, is that people who haven't uh, uh, hadn't been previously furloughed, uh, if they weren't furloughed by uh, the deadline, I think the deadline was the middle of June, wasn't it? Um, that they can't be furloughed in future. Now, those, by definition, for many companies, included some of their best, most productive, most committed people. Uh, and so what furlough's effectively done, all the changes to furlough, the closing of the, of the gate, if you like, ha has put some of the best people uh, potentially um, at risk um, uh, if, if there is a downturn um, in work. Uh, and the other aspect, and again, Snare's already mentioned this, secondment loaning, it, it keeps people working, it keeps people on top of their game. Um, so, I mean, those are those are advantages from, if you like, the lending um, employer point of view. But I think it's fair to say um, that there are significant advantages for a borrowing uh, employer as well. Uh, clearly, you avoid uh, recruitment costs of your own. Um, uh, you certainly avoid agency fees. Um, you, if you are looking for people, but only for a limited period of time, uh, you avoid, as I said, going down the agency route, and you also, at the same time, you're ca capping your commitment, capping the liabilities that you potentially would open yourself up to if you were taking people on uh, yourself uh, direct. I would also hope, given that this is a sharing of employees between an established community, people with uh, existing relationships and an interest in maintaining those relationships over the longer time, I would hope that it also gives you a greater degree of assurance about the quality uh, and commitment um, of the labour and the party with, with, with which you, uh, you're contracting. All of those, uh, for, for, from our point of view, I would suggest uh, good reasons for going down this road. And of course, it is a road that um, um, many uh, ECA members in the past have gone down and, and got a lot out of. Obviously, the role for ECA includes a, a brokerage role, effectively bringing uh, the two uh, parties together. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. And similarly, uh, we do have on the uh, coronavirus, uh, the, the business recovery uh, web page, uh, plenty of guidance notes, plenty of templates. I'll be citing those as I go along. Uh, and there are the helplines. Uh, Snares obviously already mentioned the employment helpline, uh, but there are other helplines covering the whole range of issues likely to crop up in the context of, of this um, health and safety helpline, contracts and commercial, employee relations, as I said, um, and education um, and training. Uh, next slide. Uh, please, Omar. So, I mean, I'm going to look at this this concept of loaning and secondment um, into sort of two uh, separate uh, forms. Uh, the first is the one that probably more of you are familiar with, which is the loan labour scheme. Um, and then I'll talk specifically about what we're calling a, a, a apprentice temporary secondment, which is is basically the same thing, but but in the context of apprentices. Um, Obviously, many of you will be familiar with the loan labour scheme. It's well established um, in, in many uh, regions. Uh, what, what's happened in the last few weeks um, is that the scheme's also gone online. It doesn't mean that you can't um, ring up your regional manager either with uh, labour you want to loan or, or with an interest um, in borrowing labour. It doesn't mean you can't uh, still uh, ring up your regional manager and talk to them. Uh, but there is a, an additional um, online uh, facility. And I have to say in the in the few weeks that's been in place, it has uh, uh, been used uh, quite significantly. And, and we have, and, and this is very gratifying, seen an upturn in, in the volume of, of, of loan labour inquiries. So in that sense, um, it has done uh, the job. And you'll see there the link uh, to the information page about the loan labour scheme. Um, on the on the slide. Uh, next slide, please, Omar. Yeah, uh, uh, Snayer ended her presentation about dealings between employers and employees, and talk about the importance of getting things in writing. Uh, we are aware uh, of, of members entering into lo loan labour arrangements in an informal way. Um, if it works, great. Uh, but 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 our recommendation would be. Uh, our strong recommendation would be that there does need to be a, a measure of formality. Um, 
friends don't necessarily stay friends uh, if they don't introduce a, a degree of formality um, where where it's appropriate. And, and we do think it's appropriate here, if only um, if only to achieve some clarity and some confirmation that the expectation of party A uh, it, it coincides with the expectations of, of, of party B. Plus, of course, if you've got a contract, as you know, at least that will set out how you deal with problems and issues um, as they arise. There is very extensive uh, member guidance um, on the content of what is in effect a labour only subcontract and that's been put together by Rob Driscoll and Paul Jackson um, of, of, of the legal team uh, and that's available to you via the loan labour uh, web page that you've already had uh, the reference uh, to. And of course, in terms of setting that up and dealing with any issues uh, that arise um, during the course um, of the loan labour agreement, particularly um, any any uh, commercial uh, legal uh, issues, uh, that's obviously something that the Contracts and Commercial Helpline uh, can help you there with details on the slide. Uh, next slide, please, Omar. All right, moving on to um, uh, apprentices. Um, as I say on the slide, there are instances, um, you know, it's quite a number of instances of, of this being done in a pretty informal way um, in the past. Um, what are the circumstances? Well, one one fairly regular uh, circumstance um, is where a particular business, because of the nature of the scope of its work, cannot actually give uh, the range of work to the apprentice that they require. So the obvious example there um, would be companies that are predominantly or exclusively operating in the domestic market, not necessarily a straightforward matter uh, to get your portfolio uh, together uh, for the um, existing electrotechnical apprenticeship standard, the four-year apprenticeship, um, if, if you don't have access to a, a broader range of work there. So that's an obvious example where in the past companies have shared uh, apprentices within uh, regions. Um, the other instance um, is, of course, where a company um, suffers a temporary shortfall in work and that effectively, albeit writ large, is, is the kind of a situation that we're probably dealing with here. The, the, the reality of the situation, and, and you'll probably be aware of this yourselves, but certainly it's something uh, that we get visibility of um, at ECA, is within regions, uh, even within localities, there are some companies who are work, working at full pelt, um, at or even above normal capacity, and at the same time, just down the road, uh, there there are people who have got um, who've got a slump in work, um, uh, whether short term or, or, or longer term. So so that is, if you like, the, the sort of the acme, the, the sort of perfect example of a situation where a, an arrangement such as this uh, could potentially come in handy uh, for, for both sides. I mean, there are a range of options, and um, there is a guide uh, mentioned on the slide. It, it's not actually on the website yet. I promise you, hand on heart, it will be on the website uh, by the end of uh, today. Uh, it goes into a lot more detail about all the things I'm going to sort of reference briefly um, here. Uh, it's called Keeping Apprentices in Employment. You can see the normal reference to the Back to Work um, webpage, uh, but that guide um, will be there and it will go into a lot more detail. It will explain to you, for example, you, you could have a standalone arrangement, simply um, a, a secondment arrangement just involving apprentices, or indeed, um, if you were minded to, if you were having, if you had a, a wider uh, loan labour uh, arrangement in place, there is of course scope to include um, apprentices in that, particularly of course um, uh, later stage apprentices who will be able to uh, perform productive work uh, alongside um, any training uh, objectives uh, that they might have. Um, there are options to operate full-time secondment, part-time secondment. Um, if you as a company um, can only keep an apprentice on for a reduced period um, during the week, then for the rest of the time, second to somebody else. Alternatively, it's perfectly possible uh, to have somebody furloughed for a part of the time and this then seconded over uh, uh, to somebody else. Uh, for part of the time. Uh, that leads on to the link with that final sort of sub billet point. How does this all fit with the furlough scheme? Uh, a lot of detailed discussion of that in the Keeping Apprentices in Employment guidance. But suffice to say, um, uh, if you are seconding apprentices um, and it's not earning you any money, 
uh, then chances are you can keep them furloughed and still have them seconded to somebody else. If, however, they're earning you money, they're providing a service on your behalf, you heard the terminology that Snail was using, then it's probably not prudent uh, to keep them on the furlough uh, scheme. A lot more detail on that. And of course, uh, different situations uh, can apply, different sets of circumstances. So as always, the advice, if there's any kind of complication or doubt, uh, ring the Employee Relations Helpline for some clarification and some assurance. Okay, next slide, Omar. Um, so yeah, and fi finally, really, just with um, uh, the loan uh, labour, um, I know these kind of arrangements in the past have often been done informally. It's still worthwhile um, getting some sort of formal agreement in place. Uh, in, in some instances, particularly where apprentices are performing productive work alongside fully qualified people, uh, then that agreement, at least as far as the productive work is concerned, is going to be very similar, if not identical, uh, to a loan labour agreement. But there are important differences. There are further considerations when it comes uh, to apprentices. Number of number number one, um, you would you would have to do assurance checks anyway as part of a loan labour arrangement, but those are even more uh, the case uh, within the context of apprentices, particularly if they're young uh, apprentices, obviously safeguarding specific provisions around young work safety. Uh, there's also the issue of close proximity uh, working. Uh, the photograph there um, probably isn't one uh, that, that we're seeing a lot of um, at the moment. Uh, at the very least, uh, the supervisor would have a mask on, as with the apprentice, and any sort of close interaction like that would have to be fairly brief. Um, that said, um, you will find, again, on the um, uh, ECA uh, Engineering Services Recovery uh, webpage, uh, the main webpage we've got, um, on all of this, you will find uh, there some very good guidance uh, put together by Paul Reeve um, and Paul, um, uh, Paul's colleagues um, on uh, specifically on apprentice health and safety and particular safeguards for apprentices with regard to shared travel um, and supervision on site. So, so those are well worth accessing because basically they tell you that it is possible for apprentices to go back to work. Because we hear a lot of people saying that's not the case because apprentices have to share travel. Uh, apprentices are, are, are often closely uh, supervised. There are safeguards that you can put in place. So strongly recommend reading that guidance. And there's some handy flow charts as well if you haven't seen those before. Other things to bear in mind with apprentices, even those who do productive work, they need to maintain uh, their progression. Um, and there needs to be um, a buy-in from the college or, or the training provider. Um, if college, colleges or training providers are going to have any kind of concern about this sort of arrangement, it will be, um, are the apprentices just being used as cheap labour? And, and that cannot, cannot be the case. Um, there does need to be a, a plan for progressing at the apprentice during their time. Um, on uh, secondment. And then, and I've already really alluded to this, this you know, there is a fundamental question, will the apprentice be performing productive work or not during the secondment? Are they, is this simply uh, a mechanism uh, for getting them some experience uh, to progress their training? Is there no money really changing hands? In those circumstances, you might have be able to have a, a simplified agreement uh, between the borrower and the lender. And certainly, as I've already said, it may be that that will allow you to continue uh, them on, on furlough at the same time. If they are producing uh, productive work, then that argues for a more extensive um, uh, loan labour style um, agreement alongside any um, training uh, objectives, uh, plus uh, furlough really isn't an option in those circumstances. So um, that, that's it um, from me. Obviously, if there are any questions, we'll deal with those um, later on. I'm just going to hand over uh, to, to, to Carolyn. Uh, you, you probably worked out now that, that Snea and, and I have really majored on uh, existing employees, retaining existing employees, and the various mechanisms that you can uh, use outside of the furlough scheme uh, for doing that. Um, Carolyn's focus is much more towards um, the future. So um, with your eyes very much uh, on the horizon and the future, Carolyn, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Good, good morning, everyone. Next slide, please, Omar. So I want to just briefly outline the current situation before moving on to a, a brief overview of some of the 
um, incentives and schemes that, that are there for the future. Um, the situation at the moment obviously varies by nation um, and it is subject to change um, depending upon the national picture, any local lockdowns, etc. And that's likely to be the way for the foreseeable future. Most nations are saying normality such as it, it is begins in September. In England, the message is that all ages can continue face to face training and assessment now wherever that's feasible. In practice, many providers are planning to continue the online learning that they've successfully put in place over the last few months. Um, and apprentices and other learners in the future are likely to be put into much smaller groups for training simply because of the social distancing impact and also because it avoids having to have a whole cohort quarantined or out of action if there is some form of COVID infection. Social distancing is going to be a challenge again for the foreseeable future and that will impact capacity both for training in terms of workshops and college environments but also in terms of endpoint assessment. The government recently launched its plan for jobs with a big big hurrah and lots of publicity. Several announcements in there predominantly focusing on support for young people. The major concern that government has got is youth unemployment, thousands of people who are out there leaving with or without qualifications unable to get jobs. So we're just going to look briefly at, at some of the, the new announcements that have been made. Next uh, slide please Omar. Okay, apprentice incentive payments. This is England only, I'm afraid, for anybody that might be dialing in from the nations. Um, and this is short term, for the next six months, an incentive payment if you hire a new apprentice. £2,000 per apprentice if they're aged under 25, 1500 per apprentice aged over 25. And this is in addition to the £1,000 that's already available if you take a 16 to 18 year old. So potentially up to £3,000. Now there are a few things to note. Firstly, the apprentice cannot be one of your existing employees that you want to start on an apprenticeship. And they also can't have worked for you in the past six months. You can take on somebody as an apprentice who is an existing apprentice made redundant by somebody else. A really important point here is that in order to qualify for the incentive, you must recruit the, the apprentice via the government's apprenticeship service. What many employers will be used to doing is talking to their local college or training provider, agreeing to recruit an apprentice and, and working through the allocation of apprentices that that college or training provider has. If you go down that route, you are not eligible for this incentive payment. So what you would need to do is to follow the, the web link, set up your online account with the government's apprenticeship service, reserve funding for the number of apprentices you need, and that can be um, up to 10 currently, and then you actually manage the process through that online account. The good news is that you can agree to delegate a lot of the administration to your training provider. So you can't get away from the fact that you physically have to go on there and set up the account. But once that's in place, in practice, you can agree that your training provider does a lot of the administration for you. If you are in a position where you've already agreed to take on an apprentice, perhaps for September, October with a training provider, then we'd suggest you talk to them to see how far down the line in terms of the various documentation and forms they've actually gone. Realistically, it's going to be very difficult to backtrack um, if that person has already been registered on the government system. But if, if it's a fairly sort of recent conversation and maybe the provider hasn't got through to, to filling in all of the necessary forms, there might be the potential for you to sort of hold fire, set up your account and thereby qualify for the, the incentives. The payments that um, you make, the payments for the incentives are payable 50% after 90 days and 50% after 365 days. And you will claim those payments via your online account subject to the apprentice still being employed with you and still being in training. There's another important consideration here. If you're taking on an apprentice, perhaps who was made redundant by somebody else, who is near the end of their training period, 
if they are not still in training after 365 days because they've already completed so perhaps they only need six nine ten months further training to, to take their end assessment if they're not in training after 12 months you will not receive that second part of the incentive payment you'd get the first payment because they're in training when they're with you but you wouldn't get the the final 50 percent if they've already qualified by that stage um, in terms of start of contracts they have to start between now and the 31st of jan 2021 um, and the good thing is that you have absolute freedom on how to spend the, the the incentive payment there's no audit trail you can spend it on absolutely anything that you want to next slide please omar Training ships, um, again, apologies, this is another England only program. Um, this is an existing program that's been around for a few years. And what the government is now doing is giving it a bit of a boost, making it much more flexible to really try and drive up numbers. Um, and this is essentially a try before you buy pre-employment program aimed at getting young people to go on to a job or an apprenticeship. They're looking to fund three, sorry, 30,000 additional starts and the key difference here is that there is now going to be a £1,000 per trainee payment to employers for taking a trainee on and offering them work experience um, and that payment again can be spent how you want they assume that there will be additional costs engaging with people purchasing PPE etc a few more key points to note Trainees can now include people that have got level three qualifications. Up to now, it's only been open to people qualified up to level two. So obviously we have quite a few people doing electrotechnical type courses within colleges at level three who could now be eligible to take part in a traineeship and work with you to gain experience. Maximum of 10 payments per employer. Um, the work experience, there's a flexibility there that's reduced from a 100 hour requirement down to 70 hours and the length potential length of the traineeship has been increased although the government is very clear they don't want everything to be extended to 12 months if that's not necessary their aim is to try and get people into jobs or an apprenticeship as quickly as possible a further change is that the work experience can now be with multiple employers rather than just one and we assume there that if that's the case the training provider will pro rata the the payment in some way between those involved this is all delivered via training providers a procurement process is underway literally launched in the last couple of days and the new process is supposed to be launching uh, this september next slide please omar kickstart um we have a bit of a change here in that this is um eligible across great britain we have done some checking and we believe that for this purpose they are classing Great Britain as England, Scotland and Wales, but not Northern Ireland. Um, we don't know why Northern Ireland isn't included. It, it might just be something that, that changes over time. There's been lots of publicity um, about this program. Um, it is a big investment to two billion pounds and it's essentially aimed at those people who are furthest away from the labour market. So young people unemployed claiming universal credit um, and it's a six month work placement with an employer funded at 100 percent of the national minimum wage for 25 hours a week employers are able to top that up either in terms of the hours that people work and indeed in terms of the payments a few things to note there, there is no capital on numbers per employer the government is really really keen to be seen to be addressing this issue of youth unemployment if you take people on through kickstart you are supposed to show that you are not getting rid of people in order to access the kickstart funding but at the moment there, there's no detail on how that check checking process would happen individuals on kickstart can't currently be transferred onto an apprenticeship during the kickstart process there is lobbying underway to try and change that but at the moment if you took somebody on and decided after three months they're a really good person, I'd like to put them onto the, the apprenticeship, you're, you're unable to do that. This is a programme that's being developed by the Department for Work and Pensions, DWP, rather than the Department for Education. Um, so obviously we, we await the detail from them. 
lots and lots of details still to come out. This again is supposed to be launching in September, so watching with interest to see, see what transpires. Next slide, please, Omar. So in summary, from an ECA perspective, we, we see all of this as overall a really positive investment in skills and training. There's a lot of flexibilities and firsts within what's been announced. It's the first time ever that there's been an incentive, a cash incentive for adult apprentices, which is really welcome. The apprentice incentive is great. It's more generous than anything before. Um, our concern would be that it's not actually sufficient to subsidise wages. So in reality, when businesses are stretched, is potentially £3,000 going to be sufficient to persuade somebody to take on apprentice when they might not have otherwise? There's, there's quite a wide fear that Kickstart, because it is this wage subsidy, 100% for six months, might actually displace apprentice recruitment because people go for Kickstart instead. I think our view is that because of the target audience for Kickstart, you know, young people with very few qualifications, possibly other issues, um, how relevant they will be to the type of jobs we have in building services isn't clear at the moment. It's probably more likely that there will be lower skilled jobs that seek to hoover up lots of people through Kickstart. Um, but if people do think it's got um, potential for them, then obviously it's there to be used. There's a lot of programmes, you know, the skills landscape is always changing, there's lots going on, lots of potential for, for confusion. Um, and in particular, when you've got programmes, some of them run by Department for Education, some of them run by the Department for Work and Pensions, um, it's going to be really important that government is aligned and giving a consistent message. There's a lot of work placements, so all of these have work placements which are, are absolutely key. Um, but again, we have a bit of a concern about the employer appetite and capacity to support multiple work placements, even if we're looking at, at, at normal times, let alone the, the additional challenges we have now. And remember, all of these programmes are on top of the normal work experience um, requests that would come in from schools on an annual basis. There will be additional demands for work placements for T-levels, a new qualification that will be coming next year. Um, those are going to be, to be paid at £750. So you can see you've got a whole raft of different work placement opportunities, some paid, some unpaid, um, and quite a challenge, I think, for employers to, to get to grips with what they want to support. Um, but ultimately, you know, government is really seeking to address youth unemployment. Um, they're seeking a clear sight, line of sight into jobs, and we wait to see what the, the detail will be behind all of these. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you also to Snea and Andrew for their presentations. Um, we have a host of resources here uh, for our viewers. Um, you won't be able to click on these links now on your screen, however, they will be available uh, in the uh, description for the video replay that will be available on our YouTube channel later today. That will be at youtube.com forward slash ECA live. And we now move on to the Q&A section. Um, Snea, Andrew, Carolyn, uh, I see we have no uh, questions in the questions panel at the moment. Um, however, I don't know if you wanted to maybe go over one or two of the, um, the, the more important resources that are out there for members and if you had any questions uh, for each other. <laughs> Thank you, Omar. <laughs> um, no, I think just to reiterate, I mean, from my point of view, and then um, uh, then maybe hand, hand back to Snea, um, do use the resources and, and particularly do, do not be afraid to, to pick up the phone um, uh, to Snea and Orazio on employee relations or, or, or indeed to, to Carolyn um, on, on, on education and training. We, we don't get education and training inquiries um, that frequently, but I think particularly as we move into um, uh, this landscape, and particularly if you do start to involve yourselves uh, in um, less conventional methods of, of engaging young people, then um, I, I think uh, you know just a, just a, just a call uh, to somebody would, would probably uh, be a, a good idea. 
Um, I'm just going to hand over to Snea and just ask Snea to just talk a little bit about the sorts of inquiries we are getting through uh, 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 the helpline, but I've got nothing else to say myself. Thanks, Andrew. Um, sorry, I think I didn't have the mic in the right place. Um, we are getting quite a lot of questions and there is a sort of a, a trend over the last few months and things that are coming up. Um, unfortunately, we are still getting a lot of queries about redundancies. Um, but it's always sad when that happens. Um, but also people wanting to look at alternatives um, and, and employees coming up when, when they mention the word redundancy, employees are very aware of the situation out there and the fact that they're unlikely to be able to get other jobs in the current economic, in the current work market. So they are coming in when the employer starts talking about redundancy, the employees are coming back with lots and lots of alternatives and saying, can we try this? Can you think about this? Um, which in the past hasn't really happened much when there has been a lot of redundancies. So it's a positive, it's opening up dialogues. And as I said, you know, it, it's encouraging employers and employees to think outside of what they used to think about outside the box um, and look at alternatives. Um, but as always, you know, my advice is, OK, that's fine. If you agree it, A, whatever you agree, put in review dates, review periods so that you're not committed for from here to eternity. And whatever you agree, put it in writing. Um, those two main critical things that we advise on, on, on all things that are all the changes that employers and employees are looking to make at the moment. But that, that's about it from me. Thanks, Omar. Uh, thanks, Snare. Just, yeah, just one more thing, Omar. I mean, Snare alluded to the JIB. Um, I guess probably amongst those still on the call, there'll be a few companies who are JIB companies. Um, what Snare has just said about um, the importance of talking to your employees and indeed the receptiveness of employees, uh, that, that goes for JIB companies alongside everybody else um, and, and certainly we're getting feedback from from JRB companies that that, that, that their employees are are equally uh, willing to be uh, flexible um, in ways which perhaps historically uh, wasn't the case so um, as always um, uh, as Snea suggested talk to us um, uh, but um, uh, the, the, the key thing is is to have that dialogue with your with your employees Great. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, thanks once again to our panel for their presentations today. And uh, thank you to all the viewers for watching. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the replay and all the resources and links we mentioned today will be available shortly. Thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Omar.